Thank you for downloading this episode of a History of Central Florida podcast. This is the podcast where we explore Central Florida's history through the artifacts found in local area museums and historical societies. This series is brought to you by Riches, the regional initiative to collect the history, experiences, and stories of Central Florida, and the Orange County Regional History Center. I'm Katie Kelly, and I will be your host for today's episode titled Fishing Boats. Florida has long been called a sportsman's paradise, due in part to the abundant fishing opportunities offered by its more than 7,000 miles of freshwater shoreline. In the first half of the 20th century, Central Florida was becoming an increasingly popular destination for tourists from the north, fleeing winter, who were drawn by what they saw as exotic Florida. During this time, fishing became an important part of Florida's regional identity. As recreational fishing drew visitors from the north, commercial fishing fed them. Today we are looking at two fishing boats from this era as evidence of a time when Central Florida's abundant natural resources were the only attraction necessary to make Florida a popular vacation destination. Known as the River of Lakes, the St. John's River watershed is made up of numerous bodies of water that span over 15 counties. The brackish waters of this river are home to over 170 different kinds of fish, both freshwater and saltwater varieties, which have adapted to both environments. In central Florida, the St. John's River has dotted the land with several lakes including Lake Monroe, Lake Jessup, and Lake Apopka, whose abundance of fish reportedly caused one enthusiast to exclaim that the only way not to catch fish was to keep the pole and the line in the boat. The river's plentiful resources made it a popular destination for thousands of years. Long before the arrival of Europeans, Florida's native population used the river as a major food source. Traveling the river in dugout canoes, they employed a variety of techniques including traps, baited lines, spears, and harpoons to catch the fish that were in ample supply there. In the late 19th and early 20th century, when steamboats traveling down the St. John's River began to make Florida a popular vacation destination, fishing along the St. John's River and its lakes began to make a significant impact on the area's economy. Hotels and fish camps sprang up to accommodate the increasing presence of anglers indulging in their favorite pastime. Locals found they could make a decent living acting as guides to find the best fishing spots. Some became small-scale commercial fishermen to supply the demands for fresh fish, which was considered a luxury to northerners during the winter months. Fish camps were a popular site along the St. John's River and at several of the freshwater lakes it created. Doug Kelly, author of Florida's Fishing Legends and Pioneers, told us why. Regions such as the St. John's River and other portions of North Florida became extremely popular in uh, the early going, and I'm talking about the late 1800s and up until 1930, 1940, uh, because of the access. Um, North Florida was closer to the mainland of the U.S., uh, and it was easy to traverse across Georgia or Alabama or um, those uh, Mississippi to come into Florida. And uh, the road systems back then, even though they were somewhat primitive, were far better than, in some cases, the non-existent roads in the southern part or even the central part of Florida. The railroad was another big factor. So uh, you just had a, sit a system back then where people could more easily access regions in the northern part of the state many, many years before they could ever reach, say, Miami or the Keys or, or the southwest portion. Built for utility rather than luxury, the accommodations at these fish camps were usually simple. In fact, the rustic surroundings and remote locales were part of the attraction as visitors anticipated encounters with gators, snakes, and other local wildlife. The first artifact under consideration is located at the Winter Garden Heritage Foundation and comes from one such camp located at Lake Apopka in Orange County. This was one of Central Florida's most popular recreational fishing destinations through the first half of the 20th century. This simple wooden one-person rowboat is typical of what fishermen at this time would have used at freshwater fishing camps throughout central Florida. Initially, the kind of boats used in sport fishing did not have motors, did not have uh, gas motors, of course, so they were rowboats, and they were wooden and they were heavy. And it took a pretty strong man to row, sometimes against the tide, to get out of an inlet 
or if the wind was whipping up even to go up, up rivers or up current of a river. So it was a tough row to hoe to, uh, to try to fish out of wooden boats, but people did it. Also, sailboats were converted sometimes for fishing purposes, and uh, that, that made the propulsion a little bit easier. Most of the boats were wooden, uh, and they were often handmade and not very seaworthy. There were many accidents at times and, and uh, capsizes and other problems when the weather would become inclement. It is perhaps no surprise, then, that the boat we are discussing today was actually discovered at the bottom of Lake Apopka. With Florida's new popularity as a tourist destination, enterprising local fishermen could make a living as small-scale commercial fishermen. Our second artifact, which is located at the Museum of Geneva History, was owned by one such fisherman, who sold his catch up the St. John's River at the Sanford Fish Market. What distinguishes this boat from the simple recreation vessels is the bow design, which features open slots that actually allowed water to flow into the boat. Dr. Mark Long of the University of Central Florida tells us more. Yeah, we refer to often as wet wells um, because they're designed basically to keep the fish alive, right? You, you, because what you want when you're selling fish, of course, is it to be as fresh as possible on the dock. And typically, with these freshwater fishermen uh, in, in Central Florida, they would sell them literally on the dock. Uh, there's a great image uh, that I have used uh, in my own work in Sanford uh, of a, um, a, a number of fishermen with their boats sort of tied to the dock, and they have their catch for the day sort of spread out by their boat, and they, they're positioned on the dock sort of um, so that they can have their, so their catch is sort of displayed to the person who's walking in from town, whether it's a restaurateur or an individual who wants fresh fish, uh, so that they, their, their, their catch is sort of the most prominent catch. Uh, and so they would literally sell on the dock, and the fresher the fish, the more likely you are to sell that. So that, this was, you know, this was not a unique um, technology in Florida. This was a, a, um, something that fishermen in New England had been using for years. I'm sure it predates them even, uh, perhaps even into European antecedents. But certainly in New England, there are fishermen coming from Connecticut to fish the Florida Keys, in the 1830s, uh, with with the same technology, using what they what they're called up there, they're called smacks, but the, the sort of open water wells. So most of the local fishermen, uh, with the kinds of boat that you're talking about, are really selling to local markets. Uh, the fre- it's a fresh fish market for uh, restaurants, uh, particularly in big hotels that are catering to tourists who want fresh fish when they're here in the winter. That's a you know, um, that's you know, that's a great treasure, right? To be to be able for a New Englander to eat you know, fresh fish just caught you know, that day in January and February is something they're not used to. So it was part of, in some ways, the exoticism of the Florida experience. So they would sell to restaurateurs and, and hotels and then also just to, to individuals um, in, in fish markets. In addition to this type of commercial enterprise, fishing along the St. John's watershed affected the local economy in other ways. Here is Doug Kelly again. I would not say that the uh, populations of towns and villages became uh, larger because of sport fishing. I do think they did become more economically uh, viable because it was a source of income. Uh, a, a person coming down to fish doesn't just stay at fish. They stay in a hotel. They go to restaurants. They uh, partake in other activities when they're not fishing, such as sightseeing and going to different iconic places and uh, what have you. So the money starts coming out of the wallet more uh, more in indirect ways, and of course that impacts the economy back then just as it does now. As we have seen, Central Florida was a popular vacation destination for many years before the theme parks arrived. The warm climate and natural resources were the main draws for these early tourists who flocked to Florida's beaches and resorts to escape the northern winters. They were able to engage in a tropical escape without even having to leave the country, and both commercial and recreational fishing played an important part in creating the exotic experience for which Florida was known to the pre-theme park tourist crowd. We hope you have enjoyed this episode of A History of Central Florida podcast. If you would like to see these and other items that tell the history of Central Florida, you can visit the Winter Garden Heritage Foundation, located at 1 North Main Street, Winter Garden, Florida, 34787, or the Museum of Geneva History at 165 First Street, Geneva, Florida, 32732. Make sure to join us for our next episode titled, 
leather cap and goggles.